Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to iDonjo Live, the place where classical music happens. I love that title. I keep saying that, but I really do like that title. This is Tuesday. So this is Tuesdays with Tom, and this is about song. I don't mean to be a poet or a rhymer this evening, but there you are. This is, in fact, our new series called <laughs> Song and Beyond, a cooperation of my my foundation, the Hamsong Foundation, hamsongfoundation.org, and I Dodge Live. Uh, and it's really quite fun. We're also broadcasting live on our Hamsong Foundation Facebook page, which you might be watching from, which is very exciting. Uh, and part of this series is revisiting with authors that some I've met personally, and some I haven't met personally, that helped us create the radio series. One, the first one was Song of America, which was 13 weeks, one hour programs, um, which was essentially the history of American culture seen through the eyes of our poets and the ears of our composers. And I decided that that should work across board in all poetry. So we went and did another series, another 13 weeks, with another 13 authors, or maybe 10 authors on that show. Uh, and it was, again, the history our cultural history, Western cultural history, from the Congress of Vienna, 1815, to the present day, also letting poets and composers, the eyes of and the ears of, tell that story. And we are going to dip our needle and our screen sharing a little bit into both of those long programs today, because I have the wonderful colleague and author, Jeff London, who is the author. I think you have the, you have the, you have, you did three shows, didn't you? I did, yeah. I don't know that yeah. anybody else did three shows. Christy might have done three shows at the end of the day. Yeah. But in terms of actually authoring a show, um, I think she did two shows, but I'm, if she's, she, maybe she'll write me a note and tell me what she did. But anyway, not many of you authors uh, did three shows. And it's rather extraordinary because the first one uh, we asked you to do was actually a little bit of a new territory. But we're going to get to that. We're going to get to the, we're going <laughs> to drop the needle in all three shows. We are going to do some screen sharing. We are going to talk about song and we're going to talk about composers and aesthetics that don't get talked about very much so this is really a this is a real song addict show tonight which i'm really really <laughs> uh looking forward to and having fun but first jeff london if you would please um, i mean you and i met once i i think it, at, at sort of the launch party mm -hmm. of the series most yep. of the authors I didn't in meet. Your apartment. I, I simply talked to you. Uh, so it's wonderful to see you again uh, and get to know you. And I would love for people to get to know you. So can you tell us you know, where, where did you? What were you? Where did you? Where was raised? Who was the music person in your family? How did? Where did you go to school? How did you get in all this? Give me the. Give me the five minute <laughs> Wikipedia. That's my line. <laughs> okay. Well, the the short version is I grew up outside of Washington D.C. in Silver Spring, Maryland. And uh, I did like all good kids. I studied piano, although I didn't like to practice very much. Okay. And, uh, but, my, but, yeah. but my mom actually was in the Montgomery County Symphony Orchestra. She was a uh, French horn player. I love it. So uh, she would schlep me to rehearsals and uh, I, I would be an usher at concerts or whatever. And uh, when I got a little older, I started playing the flute and uh, I was in youth orchestras. I also sang in choruses. Uh, I went to music camp. You know, I did all that stuff that kids do. But the, the thing that really uh, kind of crystallized things for me was when I was in ninth grade and a few friends and I decided that we wanted to get out of class. Uh, there was a substitute teacher and we said, oh, we work in the other room and we're writing a musical. And <laughs> we actually got out of class. And, uh, and then we thought, oh, well, maybe we should write a musical. And they looked at me and said, Jeff, you're the guy who's serious about music. So you should write the, the music. And I was like, come on, really? I didn't even know how to notate anything. How, how old are you at this time? Ah, uh, this was ninth grade, so what is one, 14, 15? 15, something like that, yeah. <laughs> but we actually wrote the musical. It was a terrible show. It was called The Dark Side of the Sun, but it got produced for three performances at our junior high school. And 
long story short, I still write to this very day with the guy who was the words guy who no. decided he wanted to write lyrics. And we wrote, well, we wrote a lot of things together over the years, but um, I went to Oberlin College where I was an English major and a history minor. But of course, Oberlin has this amazing conservatory of music. Yeah, and so the entire time that I was at Oberlin College, I took composition lessons uh, with the faculty there. And I took wow. music theory and stuff like that. And I wrote musicals, but I also wrote, you know, quote unquote, the serious music with my uh, composition professor who, as it turned out, had orchestrated a very early Lerner and Lowe show. He was a guy named Joseph Wood. Um, and uh, yeah, we did, I did, I think three shows when I was in college and I was also doing radio at the time. Yeah, I, was, I didn't you know, know this. I didn't know this. Yeah, I, yeah. I, th I knew you were a music guy and musician and all that, but I thought you were totally an author. I didn't realize that you ever yeah. composed anything. I didn't realize that. Fantastic. Well, I, I kind of had two tracks going. Yeah. I went after I, after I graduated from Oberlin, I did the total cliche, which was, I was a, <laughs> I was a waiter in a Middle Eastern nightclub in the village. And I remember in one very, terrible night with hardly any customers opening the New York Times and seeing that NYU was having the very first musical theater program for writers. And I was like, oh my, oh my God, this is what I should do. So I was one of the first people who was accepted in the program. And my writing partner from junior mm -hmm. high school <laughs> Was except he was going to Brandeis at the time, you know, graduate uh, dramatic writing. He was accepted as well, and it was an intense two years. We studied with the first the first people we studied with were uh, Stephen Sondheim and Hal Prince. They were working on Merrily We Roll Along, but we studied with Leonard Bernstein. Spent My three God. weeks with him. We studied with. Julie Stein, who uh, yelled at me one day about, I don't want to know that you went to a conservatory, write a song, write a rah, 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 rah. Uh, <laughs> you know, and it was great. We just sort of sat at, at the feet of these greats and just listened to them and played stuff. But at the very same time, I started doing radio rather seriously. There was a guy on WBAI, I don't know if, you know, in New York, you ever listened to that. That was the Pacific. I know the call letter, but I don't know it. Yeah. A lot of people trained in radio at BAI. Nobody got paid for it, but we got free records. And, you know, we did like a little documentary a week. So I learned how to interview people and I learned how to cut tape and I learned all of that stuff. We got money to do it. And round about 1990, I started doing documentaries for NPR uh, and I would do one or two a year, mostly on Tin Pan Alley and music. Uh, and then in 2000, I got hired by them to, to start reporting. And uh, I've been basically an arts That's reporter. How you, that was how you were on my radar. The, this one yeah. is how you came up on, on our radar, I should say for the, for the foundation, for the foundation project. I didn't realize that, my God, I didn't read it. We have so much to talk about. I can hardly wait until oh, we, de we back definitely together. Do. The wine is going to flow. I mean, I can't imagine. Oh, absolutely. Very back story. in the day with yeah. Prince and Sondheim and, of course, yeah. the magnificent Lenny. I mean, my God. In heaven. Yeah, yeah. Wow. You know, even as we, we had, a, my partner and I had a show that was done at the public theater, and I distinctly remember sitting, playing technical rehearsal, and working on a documentary on the 50th anniversary of Oklahoma at the same time. Like, you know, we, <laughs> it's like, oh, you need some music? Okay, fine, I'll play that. Oh, we have 10 minutes while you work out this lighting cue. All right, then we'll, uh, uh, oh we'll work on that. So, that, so I've had this two-pronged career. I should say. Well, yeah. that, that makes that that makes actually our, our segue into the first show in the Song of America series of 13 uh, series, uh, 13, 13 weeks, one hour shows, 40 minutes of music telling the story and me connecting it 
uh, uh, with with the narration, we tried to focus on places, issues, concepts, not chronological. You know, it wasn't about the history of songs, about the culture and history of America. My thesis to American repertoire in general, but specifically to American song, is that is that it's ridiculous to try and find our Debussy or our Poulenc or our Brahms or our Schubert. Uh, even though there was a great deal of admiration of our of our composers for these people and so forth, that 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 our cultural history or the arts in America and, and the creativity, which has been, I think, is quite underestimated by by people generally today. We have been unbelievably creative in in America and also in the classic idiom, um, enormous amounts of repertoire. And but probably the problem is that is that they're so epoch specific we were very sensitive as americans to things that sound like the 40s or the turn of the century or the 60s and we'll get into that to the latter part of the show but the but i always found that there's a certain kind of diary encased and and what was also on top of the diary meaning that 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 some particular creative moment especially in the song repertoire captures the essence of what that period was about and mostly through the text, but then the cross-generational conversation to the musician. And I, I find that a very compelling way to, to understand what Americanism is and, and also the, the plurality of it. And I, I'm not trying to make a political statement out of this, although it's inevitably political, because yes, we are e pluribus unum. People politically think that the word unum means homogen homogenous, which is nonsense. It means, it means a common spirit, a common ideal of celebration of the pluribus. And what better way to do that than to drill down in the various cultures and in the various epochs of our own of our own culture and this is all a preamble to say that we we i when it was me i said well if he really knows what he's doing you know, I said, <laughs> give him farewell <laughs> you know we were looking for somebody to give farewell to and i i almost called the show finding farewell but um, <laughs> finding farewell is is a bigger concept of of rediscovering the history of arts especially the arts and humanities in america which is quite near and dear to my heart that that search as well as that storyline but we threw you arthur farwell what was that like was that a surprise had you ever heard of arthur I had never heard of Arthur Farwell. Um, Miriam Lewin uh, was the person who recruited me. Miriam and I sang together in a chorus for, I don't know, eight or nine years or whatever. And her friend Naomi is a very good friend of mine. And she said, would you like to do this series? And I'm like, wow, that sounds great. And she said, we'd like you to do a story about Arthur Farwell. And I was like, who? Yeah. Who? who? You know, so... And she probably I, I said, think you, I, you need to be, be very careful about it because Tom was very passionate about this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and she said that. I want, well, give, I want to give, by the way, I want to, before we go any further, I want to give a shout out. We had such an incredible team putting these oh, yeah. shows together. We had Carolyn Paulin as, as, uh, as producer, back producer at WFMT in, in Chicago. Steve Robinson was running the network, WFMT network, and he was an amazing producer. But Miriam Lewin, and I'm sure accessing her her wonderful sister uh, Naomi, but especially yeah. Miriam as a as a midline producer, and of course coordinating on our side with with the incredible Christy Finn, who raves ro ro ranges between content manager and managing director uh, with equal aplomb. You know, it was just it was a hell of a lot of fun, and Miriam certainly knew you guys from various various aspects of right. life yeah. that we needed not i i didn't know it. i'd heard uh and maybe i hadn't even heard maybe miriam sent me a, check this guy out see what do you think i i just know that when when i was aware of you it was like yeah that sounds like a fun you think you'd do far well <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead well, you know what, if you're watching what, ahead, and, 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 and miriam and christy and, and naomi and, and carolyn we love you i love you <laughs> And I love you all too. Um, I, yeah, it was, um, how to describe it? I, I, it? It was like jumping into the rabbit hole. You know, the thing about Farwell is um, there wasn't a heck of a lot written about him. Um, there, you know, was, a, I think, like a two-page uh, Wikipedia 
uh, thing. And if you went on some of the links in Wikipedia, you could find a bit more. But there was one, one book by this uh, woman named Evelyn Culbertson. Right. And uh, it was, I mean, like the size of a doorstop. It was kind of, you know, halfway between a biography, but not really a biography, and very much a catalog of everything he wrote. And it was enormously helpful and enormously frustrating at the same time, because she had this catalog of all this stuff that Arthur Farwell had written from, you know, a very young man to a fairly old guy. Right. Yeah. Um, but there were very few recordings. But there was one, one happy coincidence as I'm leafing through the book and I'm taking notes and I'm looking at it and I'm getting more and more interested in this guy. And, and we got to talk about this guy because he really was an American original. Um, I saw in the notes that there had been a recording of some songs by a guy named Neely Bruce at Wesleyan University. And my brother had gone to Wesleyan University and Neely conducted the chorus there and also did all of these uh, musicology classes. So I found his Wesleyan address. I actually this morning went back and looked at all the correspondence that, that we had back then. And I said, hey, Neely, so, you know, I'm just at the beginning of this Farwell project, but do you want to talk about Farwell? Do you have some music? Do you have some recordings? And we arranged, we had this incredible afternoon yeah. in New Haven. He came down from uh, Wesleyan. I came up from New York. He had a friend who had a, a piano store in New Haven. And uh, we spent an afternoon talking about Farwell. He showed me all of these manuscripts. He played through a Farwell sonata, a piano sonata that was really difficult, thorny stuff. And he played me other stuff. He did demonstrations. And then I was like, hey, Neely, so you know some of Farwell's kids? Are they still around? Are they compost mentis? And one of them uh, wasn't too together, but there was his son, who's still around now, named Jonathan, who, as it turns out, growing up in the Washington, D.C. area, he was a very good actor. And he was at arena stage. So I saw him when I was a kid. And then when I went to college, uh, he was an actor at the Cleveland Playhouse. So I saw him there. And as a Star Trek nerd, he was an evil captain in the first season of Star Trek The Next Generation. Anyway, I got hooked up with Jonathan. I had an amazing interview with Jonathan who knew everything about his dad. Uh, gave me all sorts of biographical details and sent me six CDs of recorded material, some of which I had, some of which I didn't have, including Neely performing yeah. some yeah. of these Farwell songs. So anyway, that, all that to say is it turned out to be this fascinating um, uh, the, exploration of a guy I'd never heard of. So I, I guess you probably want to know or want me to say a little bit about who Arthur Farwell was. Uh, well, I think I think we should. I think I mean, we're first of all, ladies and gentlemen, the, the, I've been fascinated about Arthur Farwell from the to, from the get go. And also, I'm I'm really excited. Uh, there's a there's a wonderful American musicologist uh, and author, uh, Joseph Horowitz who uh, is now with a postmodern uh, uh, group in uh, DC and they're doing really wonderful programs on what we, I suppose, fringe repertoire, but, but actually heartbeat of forgotten repertoire. And, and I, I couldn't, as, as I was reading his blog, he has a wonderful blog called The Unanswered Question, uh, which I really can recommend to anybody, everybody. Uh, and Joseph, we had one more conversation, but he wrote he he wrote this fantastic article on Burle, who's also another one of my great idols, the the young African American baritone, then become conductor assistant to Dvorak, um, and I think somewhere in that circle, somewhere along the line, I came across uh, Farwell songs, but the story of Farwell as well uh, just captivated me. And we're talking about 
really an, an anomalous situation. And I need to talk, and Joe has written a lot about Farwell, um, justifiably, and he's gotten a real passion about it. And I'll tell you why. And he's, and he's absolutely 100% right. First of all, Farwell and Ives are almost exactly contemporaneous. By like they, two years. Yeah, exactly. Ives was I mean, like two years later long, and died two years later. Yeah, exactly. And they had nothing to do with one another. And yet, if you read what Farwell writes about the inspiration of democratic spirit in musical and political composition, i.e. Walt Whitman, uh, and if you read Ives, exactly the same subject, the evidence of true democracy is in the creation of poetry and music and the evidence of the soul and the spirit, you know, sort of the transcendentalist, you know, pouring through Ives' writing. Uh, you would think that they were, you know, in the same club somewhere, they would have something to do with it. It's, it's really remarkable how tangential these lives lived and yet had nothing to do with one another. And that captivated me, captivated me completely. Arthur Falwell, if he's remembered or known or referenced in some kind of musical context in America, musical historical context, he belongs or he is put into this big group or small group, how you want to look at it, of Indianists, uh, sort of pre-turn of the century, pre, pre-World War I, uh, well-meaning, I would like to believe, American composers uh, trying to capture in the spirit of Dvorak some acoustical remembrance or association with the American Indian ritual musical existence. Now, I'm being guarded by this because on the one hand, you have people like Alice B. Fletcher going out and doing ethnological <laughs> work, and she was the patron saint of what all the Lomaxes did, and that's actually what's at the Library of Congress, and it's fascinating to have been down there so much work on that. Then there were a whole bunch of other folks who were just simply damn fascinated about it. Some of them actually went out and lived with the Indians, and some didn't. Mr. Cadman never went <laughs> and lived with an Indian. Okay. Arthur Farwell would go to the Plains Indians and live with them and notate and learn their rhythms. Um, and he was an, um, an amazingly altruistic, idealistic, naive kind of genius. And he was so inspired by Dvorak and the idea that he's hearing, he's got his ear to the ground, and that is the African-American melodies and especially the Indian melodies, which are a little bit more difficult because Indian music is essentially structured on ritual, but that's another conversation. And, and so he's, he's trying to create you know, the realness. He's using texts in his songs from the, the Plains Indians traditions. Um, he's he's and, and I and I want to. I'm just going into this because there's an enormous conversation, rightfully so, going on in our country about cultural approbation. Approbation. Yep. Um, yeah. And and unfortunately, from a lot from the American Indian side, um, uh, Native American side, um, there's a there's just a, a blanket dismissal of of that whole school. And unfortunately, Farwell falls under the bus as well. And, and two things are wrong with that. And I would like to mind paint along with that. And I agree with Joe Horowitz that that's not the right thing to do. One, we don't actually look at Farwell as a composer. And Farwell was a far more engaged composer on every level than simply his, his spiritual identification with the American Indian. And I do want to play, we're going to, we're going to do a little screen sharing. Um, uh, we have Jonathan Farwell talking about his father's respect, not just for the Native American melodies, but for the spiritual underpinning. So I'm going to do, um, if you want to augment that, I'm going to do some screen sharing, ladies and gentlemen. The next thing you'll yeah. see is us going into, uh, 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 no, 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 sorry, wait a minute. I have to do something different here. My bad. Say something. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, Farwell was, I, I think I, I should also say that, you know, Farwell was deeply uh, affected by Dvorak. You know, he was, uh, he went to MIT to study electrical engineering yeah, guy was and got a degree in electrical engineering, but he was living in Cambridge and he was crossing the river to Boston and he went to hear uh, the newly minted 
New World Symphony. And, you know, Dvorak had come to America. Dvorak had used Czech folk melody in his work. And, you know, what he did was, I guess, he, he, oop, he had studied with Burley. He was attracted to the spiritual... Go ahead, sorry. Okay. He studied with Burley, so there was some uh, African-American influence in it. And, you know, and there's a story that actually Jonathan told about how his dad just kind of walked around Boston for hours after the concert, thinking, I have to figure out a way to incorporate folk music into a distinct American music. And, you know, Dvorak also spent some time uh, with with uh, Native Americans and his American quartet reflect some of the melodies that he heard there. So anyway, uh, all that to say, um, Farwell was definitely influenced, did a lot of studying, listened to, uh, looked at Fletcher's book and, uh, and was not just playing lip service, his son yeah. said, you know? To that, get the idea, this and this show isn't about apologetics for Arthur Farwell. This is this is a this is a this is a show behind the scenes with the author and discussing one of our favorite my favorite subjects and this rather amazing life, uh, and also carrying a bit of a torch. And I'm really glad to have uh, Joseph Horowitz jumping in on this as well because Arthur will, you know, I don't know if, you, I don't know if you've ever heard like uh, I think it's Gods of the Mountains orchestral piece, mm -hmm. it's an unbelievably beautiful piece, and and Joe is a big a uh, huge proponent of the Hako uh, string quartet and the piano pieces are well known but he but also Arthur well Arthur Farwell he, he loved Emily Dickinson and he said I don't know how many studies of music but what it I want to like play right now right, yeah. exactly what you're looking at right now ladies and gentlemen is the is the is a page in the sub site from the American from the uh, Hamson Foundation called Song of America and it's songofamerica.net and on here you can visit our radio series both of them in in you know, at whatever leisure you would like. I have, in fact, queued up at about 10 minutes into it where Jonathan Farwell, Arthur Farwell's son, is discussing his father's devotion to the American Indian. Underpinning, supporting the music. In his publication of the American Indian Melodies, he writes an introduction which is a, a profound statement of his respect for the Native American spirit and the Native American ethos and way of relating to life and the world and their sense of divinity. And so he took very seriously the cultural and inner life of the Native American. And so he was not simply using melodies as uh, casual tools to create compositions of his own. He felt he was writing to try to express something of the Native American spirit. In 1908... Now, I got to tell you, I mean, I'll come back out here. Uh, I got to tell you, uh, Jeff, I remember Miriam calling me up and saying, you know, Jeff's it's turned into a bit of a detective story. And I said, yeah, I'm quite sure that's true. Uh, and he said, yeah, but he's actually got some interviews. We've never done that before. How do you feel about somebody else talking on your show? I said... <laughs> I love it. I think it's a great idea. He said, yeah, well, he's got quite, he's got somebody called Neely Bruce. And I said, you're kidding me. He found Neely Bruce because I'd read the book, you know, and, yeah. and, and he said, yeah, but you're going to like this. He's got Arthur's son. I said, oh my God, give him the whole show. Does he want to narrate it? Just do it. Whatever. It's fantastic. <laughs> so this was really very exciting. This is Jonathan talking about his father. I mean, the other thing, ladies and gentlemen, you know, Arthur Farwell crisscrossed the United States between 1903 and 1912, probably 15 times and he would go to communities and write pageants he was the first composer in residence at the bohemian grove in in san francisco and he would he would go in it reminds me a little bit of the stories of of the ancient uh, chinese emperors who would go to the villages and they would and they would chant the villages all would have to come out in the corner to to meet the the emperor's ambassador and they would chant and by the sound of the equanimity of the chant the 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 actual physical sound of that community would tell the representative whether there was on whether there was unrest in the community huh. yeah yeah right and yeah. arthur would kind of do that as well he would go in and galvanize everyone in this democratic celebratory reflective moment and live with them and talk with them and write pageants and pieces and this guy could sing and that guy could dance and he could narrate and it would all culminate in sort of you know this weekend of of 
of of madness and celebration of the democratic free spirit of America. And then he would sort of <laughs> like the Pied Piper move into another community. I mean, it was, it was yeah. an extraordinary life. It, you know, you read about it, you realize he put together like a thousand yeah. people yeah. in Central Park. Yeah. The first use of electric light to do this enormous pageant from which that uh, symphony came about. But, you know, he also was a fantastic teacher. He taught at Cornell, he taught at Berkeley. He taught uh, for, I, I don't know, a couple of decades at Michigan State in Lansing. And we, I guess we can talk a little bit later uh, uh, about that, but... Uh, Look, yeah. I've got a couple of things I want to write because I, I just I love that I, I, I want to just leave it in your hands, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about a fascinating American spirit, you know, contemporary to the extraordinary and we always give Ives rightfully slow so this this blossoming of of uh, and, and creation as, a, as an American composer with his second symphony, which is just an iconic moment in in the watershed of arts in America. But there's there are what I would call these these forgotten chapters of American creativity. There are several composers, and some I've had a chance to know, like Eleanor Remick Warren. When was the last time we had a conversation about Eleanor Remick Warren? And yet she lived to be 92. She wrote I don't know how many songs and how many oratorios and cantatas. I I recorded five of them. Uh, you know, she was in, but it's just these private corners of creativity and some, you know, she happened to be in Los Angeles and that happened there. She studied in New York, but, you know, we don't, there's stories like this all over, uh, even to even today, if you've been to Winona, Minnesota, which is just two hours south of St. Paul and Minneapolis, you have an extraordinary private collection open, of course, to the public uh, in the most generous way of maritime art from 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 I mean, for the greatest of the American people to to Renoir and 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 Bonnard, it's in you know in this little village on the Mississippi. This is America. Yeah. This is what we should celebrate in America. Yeah. There's so many wonderful theaters and and concert halls are dotted across America that are probably in ill repair and not used very much. That used to be the you know the whistle stops of tours of famous and maybe not so famous or, or would like to be famous artists. But nevertheless, this invigoration of the of the community diary of America through the arts and performing arts. And, you know, I, I wish we could somehow get that alive. The idea of cultural approbation and uh, or appropriation, uh, and, it's a, and it is an incredibly important subject, and we must all be willing to answer tough questions with with tough answers and and i i came across i came across again through joe horowitz's and his and his blog and he's quoting uh delta david greer who is obviously an american indian with the south dakota symphony they're talking in fact about farewell farewell and he's being quite quite generous about that um and i don't want to get too bogged down in this but, he, but he, there's there's a there's a sentence about about what this is all about that I think is something I've said is how can we how can we abhor and 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 deny and and literally physically hate and forbid the obscenities of previous generations without destroying the people that lived in those generations? How could, how do we get to do that? How do we get to move on? How do we get to live? Yeah. I don't need to condemn Stephen Foster to be disgusted by minstrelsy. And now, right. and, 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 and I'm gonna read this quote. Um, and it's, and he's quoting, he's quoting Delta David Geary. He said, he deals, he being Farwell deals with what I think we will need to deal with when we talk about Farwell. No, I'm sorry, Geary is, it, Horowitz is talking about Geary, I beg your pardon. Gear deals with what I think we will need to deal with when we talk about Farwell, the idea of cultural appropriation. I think I said that wrong twice, appropriation. Relating to Farwell and the other Indianists. One could accuse Dvorak of that too. And Gershwin. 
Anyway, that's one reason why that clip from Jonathan Falwell is worth playing. Also, and why, and we only glancingly mention this in the program. Falwell did settings of co ah no, this is you. I'm sorry. Oh, this is me. Yeah, this is I've got, me. I've got my stuff all turned around here. I'm going to go back and read what I. But, but no, we, but we, it, we but don't it. mention. It doesn't get talk exactly what you were about to say, or I'm going to say for you. You know, Falwell wrote Kobe songs and folk songs and Spanish songs from old California, and he was looking at a lot of places. Tom? I'm losing you, but maybe it's my headphones. I'm I'm having a hard time hearing. Can I muted my microphone inadvertently. Now, now I'm back. back. Okay. <laughs> yeah, for some reason it dropped out. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Here I don't know what you said, but I'm sure it was uh, right. I'm sure it was great. You were were you I'm quoting Horowitz's article? We want to get to the other yeah. side of the show, and I and I, but I want to yeah, make this yeah. point because I think Joe is is so articulated in this. So, what was Farwell trying to do? He believed it was a democratic obligation of Americans of European descent to try to understand the indigenous Americans that they displaced and oppressed, to preserve something of their civilization, to find a path forward reconciliation toward reconciliation his indianist indianist compositions attempt to mediate between native american ritual and the western concert tradition like bartok in transylvania like stravinsky in rural russia he endeavored to fashion a concert idiom that would paradoxically project the integrity of unvarnished vernacular dance and song he aspired to capture specific musical characteristics, but also something additional, something ineffable and elemental, quote unquote, religious and legendary, quote from Farwell. He called it, Farwell, a phrase belonging to another time and place, quote unquote, race spirit. I think that is one of the most beautiful things Joe's written. I mean, I think it's just, a, I think it puts... It, it allows us to at least examine the value of the effort uh, rather than just dismissing people's lives for an obscenity. And I want to say here that I, as an Anglo-American artist, have always and carry with me such a weight of not guilt, but but mis not understanding how can we possibly align the indigenous people's experience in America with the American story. This is a challenge that, that as much as Black Lives Matter, we need to accept this challenge as well. And maybe we can do it through music. There's some, been some wonderful projects in DC and Joe's, and Joe's headed up and, and the American Indian um, uh, Smithsonian Museum has had their own projects. And, mm -hmm. You know, this is a this is, you know, this is the this is the time that we live in. It is time for us to embrace these obscenities, own them, clean them, and move on together. In my opinion, yeah, it's about contextualizing it too. Mm, uh, absolutely, you know, um, and I think once you contextualize Farwell, then you can you can listen to him. Um, you know, without just kind of, do you want to play that clip that I had yeah. of Neely? It's yeah, about let's two, do that. Let's, two minutes let's because have, let's have some, I, I let's, think, uh, I think what that does is it explains how, as Jonathan said, he wasn't just kind of ripping off Native American uh, music and language, but he was enfolding it into something very, um, very original. All right, um, so now it is in, I'm back into Arthur Fowl. We're going to go forward well to 14, Three. right? 1403. Yeah, I think it was about 1403. Has, and it's about two saying. minutes of Neely Franz just Schubert. kind of taking one of the songs <laughs> and uh, and showing how it works and how different Farwell was from Schubert. 
you know. Well, here we go. Right on it. Here we go. Franz Schubert. Now, the text of this, which I didn't bother to sing, is Wakonda, Deep Rolls Thy Thunder. And Wakonda is one of the names of the Great Spirit. You hear the sort of rolling of the thunder. And, of course, these chords are uh, derived from the whole tone scale. So this very French sounding. is very French harmonic vocabulary. But the total static quality of the chords, basically nothing is happening in the first page of this song except the iteration of these notes and the evocation. And, and let's see if I can do it. It's a shocking sort of uh, vocal line, which I play. That's not your typical vocal line. You don't find that in Schubert songs. It's like a yell. It's not only invoking the great spirits, but it's a yell. Anyway, uh, Wakonda, deep rolls like thunder. That repeats Wakonda. They speak to me, my friend, the weeping ones. Hark, in deep rolling thunder calling. And we get away from the whole tone idea. And we have, again, very French sounding harmonies, but of a different sort. Uh, seventh chords, unusual colors, and so on. Here we go. hear the thunder. It's an absolutely magical evocation, and I think very, very original, the combination of the kind of French harmonic vocabulary, the Indian tune, and a kind of syntax that is neither one. It's kind of typical American avoidance of harmonic implication. What a wonderful, what a wonderful clip, huh? I mean, that kind of... Yeah. I mean, that gives so much credit. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, um, on, in on the Song of America, uh, .net, somewhere in the library, um, I've actually sung all three of these Indian songs, but also Joe Horowitz and at the post-classical uh, uh, or post-modern post um, uh, performance group in D.C. on their website, and I should pull that up here because I think I'm probably saying it wrong. Uh, they have done a series, and Bill Sharp sings and talks about the songs if you become interested in that, which is really quite wonderful. Some other people we need to get on the show here. Um, well, anyway, this, you know, what we should, I, there was one more thing I wanted just to have, just to have had the experience of of the other world of of uh, Arthur Farwell, and that is if we go now, this is this is actually the Idajo website, and and by the way, you can uh, the website you've got an, an, on idajo.com. You can get the app for your computer, for your telephone, for your iPad. You can also do things if you make if you make a playlist, it goes synchronizes immediately uh, to all of your different um, different devices, but. Let's just hear the other complete other side of Mr. Farwell. And I mean, if you just if I just drop the needle of this, I don't think you would believe this was him. It's the same man. Uh-huh. My he's okay, we need to reload the why is he not playing? Come on, play along. I should have put it in the app. How why is that doing? Let me read it. Let me read it. Read it. I'm reloading the site. Maybe it just got caught up and it's and it's just being irritating. We're not having the best of technical <laughs> nights this evening. Here we go. I mean, 
one could almost try and smoke you and say, oh, that was Charles Ives in a good mood, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I have to say, I hear the same DNA. I realize that that's a piece that was written maybe 30 years later. Yeah. Uh, is that, was that one of his polytonal etudes or whatever? No, it's actually uh, yeah. some, some <laughs> deep, deep water, some in, in 1937. Oh, oh. Yeah. By this time, yeah, yeah. isn't composing anymore at all. But right. Yeah. No, he had stopped. Uh, one thing before we say goodbye to Farwell, there's one thing that's like really important about Farwell. You know, he supported and advocated for American composers. He put his money where his mouth was yeah. and lost a lot of money at it. But he created uh, very early on something called the Wawan Press, which is, uh, what does it mean? It's I, something it, about it, singing, no, 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 singing no, no, no. to one it, another. It, it, but, we're going to tell the story together. It's a fantastic thing. He created the Wawan Press. He was the first one to actually celebrate singularly American composers by, you know, Loomis's work and Gilbert's first work and other, whatever you could find American. And this Wawan Press, he printed it himself. He did his own lithography himself. I have several first editions of of of, of oh, wow. words, you know i've been able to collect you can't get any I've, I've held the first edition from the library of congress in my hand there was a reprint in the late uh, late 80s that that i was able to to buy wawan is the title of a, an american indian ceremony uh of the of the plains indian tradition uh and it literally means one sings to one another and he thought he yeah. was being very clever and devoted and reverential. And it's probably one of the most singular reasons why nobody bought uh, the books because <laughs> they didn't know what is all this. I don't want to do. Shermer bought it after five rather difficult years. Uh, and he had, had hoped that that would be a galvanizing of an American wing of publication. But that's how naive he was. They shut it down and never, no one ever spoke of it again. So sorry to jump I in. I have to story, say. No, no, but I have to say one thing that I really appreciated, and we put we put in a, a piece in this. He hired he he published the music by nine women composers at a time when people were you know out of I think thirty seven. Um, so he was really kind of thinking in in those terms at the same time. And actually, I, I was looking uh, again, and one of his uh, one of his students, he, his his most famous student was Roy Harris, right? Who was an, who was another you know really important American composer right. uh, who wrote something like eighteen symphonies. Kusevitsky every adored one him. on American themes. Yeah, pardon. Kusevitsky adored him. Yes, 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 and uh, premiered uh, the Third Symphony, which is one of the great great American symphonies. Um, but uh, Harris, but there was another woman who only died, oh, I don't know, in 2003, who, you know, did various kinds of music in the latter part of her life. She was a punk rocker. So as far well, Farwell's reach went it's, really it's, far. It's, it's huge. It's it's really it's huge. It's 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 remarkable. Um, I mean, we could spend more time. I mean, we probably should have just done a Farwell show. I did want to touch on your other <laughs> two shows. We're gonna we're gonna leave. We're gonna say farewell to Mr. Farwell, uh, <laughs> and and if we piqued your interest, so be it. Uh, and I have a feeling with Joe Horowitz at the helm, we are going to be hearing more about Mr. Farwell. Um, and and I I think uh, I think I think that's good um, in everything he represents. Um, so then we came back after the Song of America, uh, and you survived Farwell. Is there anything else you <laughs> want to say about Farwell? I mean, it was an amazing experience for you. But I mean, was there something? Yeah, there's there's so much about Farwell. I was so fascinated. I mean, years later, I I was in California and I went to the Loomis house, and he had traveled with Loomis, and he had transcribed. Uh, Spanish songs in old California, which was a book that came out. And, and I, and I actually was at the Loomis house. I wish I had uh, found it earlier, but I listened to some recordings that were made on cylinders at the time. So it was unbelievable. It, it's, there's so much more about Arthur Farwell that can be explored and discovered. Okay. 
I just looked it up before we before we move on. I, I want to apologize to Joe and his group. It's called the Post Classical Ensemble. And if you go to PCE, if you go to Post Classical Ensemble, I believe dot com. It might be dot org, but I think it's dot com. You will you will have a, a wonderful a wonderful resource. Of, of their projects about American music and from and and other music as well, from Shostakovich to William Dawson to Arthur Farwell to Henry Burley and so forth. I just wanted to set my mind at ease and and apologize for mispronouncing things, which I'm unfortunately famous for. <laughs> All right, we um, we we're going to move on a little bit, and that is that we had two other shows, and it was a rather right right towards the end of it. In the in in telling the story of of sort of who we are as a Western civilization from from Beethoven Schubert uh, Congress of Vienna eighteen fifteen to modern times as we got moved forward, I think Miriam thought you would be also the right person and and we loved the Farwell show so much, so we had two shows readily actually eleven and twelve I think right yeah uh, thirteen shows. One was focused on what was going on in song after World War II. And then another one was a slightly provocative title called The Return of Melody. Is there some way as, as an author you can take us quickly in both of those? Can you, can you do that? And then we'll sure. talk to you uh, a little bit. <laughs> it, was a, it was a daunting task uh, in a completely different way uh, in that, you know, the brief was to try and, and come up with a survey over the course of these two hours right. with one, one example per composer. Now, some composers managed to get in a couple of, a couple of things in, in, in each program, but I spent, I, I don't know, a couple of months listening to lots and lots and lots and lots of songs and thinking about poetry and also thinking about what was going on historically and how the uh, composers were responding emotionally to what was going on. So we actually started the, uh, the uh, post-war, the new world order with um, Benjamin Britten, who was a noted pacifist, um, who had actually toured with Yehudi Menuhin to places like the Bergen-Belsen camp hmm. right after the war and had played concerts for all of these people who had survived the Holocaust. And he was so um, upset by it and uh, that he set a bunch of John Donne sonnets. And he was actually, you know, as I'm doing research, he was actually writing Death Be Not Proud at the same time the bombs were dropping on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, anyway, so we were dealing with a few people who wrote song right after World War II and how they were processing it. There was a, we played a Hindemith song, you know, somebody who became a naturalized American citizen in 1943 because he had to get out of Germany. Um, we also played a lot of composers and it was fascinating, were responding to folk elements, mm -hmm. either folk music that they created or actual folk songs that they adapted. Um, the other part of m my own personal brief was if I could find recordings that featured a composer at the piano, that sort of took primacy, but I came up with lo just lists and lists of, we could use this piece by Copeland, we could use this piece by Copeland, we could use this piece by Copeland, and it all yeah. depends on how we put it together. What but, I loved about what I loved about the show and what you did with that was it you know we really paid tribute without actually probably saying it we might have said it in the script somewhere but Vivian Perlis, who has this remarkable or had this remark, she is still there, but she's unfortunately left us, uh, a monument of, of American musicology and, and this oral history of, 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 
you know, composers of the time. And, and these, it's a wonderful book she has. It's a wonderful website. Of course, Yale. I, I also forgot to mention, I, I find it very ironic <laughs> that, that you and, and Neely find each other in New Haven. <laughs> which is Yale, yeah. and Yale is the repository of all of Charles Ives, most of Charles Ives' stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's the irony is wonderful. Should we have a listen? I mean, since we're going to do a little bit of oral history, why don't we go into screen sharing? I've queued up Aaron Copeland, uh, I think. Hey, let me, I can't yeah. do this. I, I, I've gotten very clever about, why well, I'm not so clever, that's yeah. the problem. <laughs> you have I, to I, I have to say, we did kind of keep a little bit of the documentary style that we had done in Farwell. Yeah. Uh, but I found a couple of uh, pieces of archival tape that I thought would be useful uh, in, in this particular program. And one was Copeland about how he utilizes folk material. That's what this, the, that's what this is yeah. right here. Yeah. Uh, let's, have a, let's have a listen to it. Copeland told National Public Radio in 1980 that writing simply is not so easy. Well, it's fascinating to work with folk materials because there's a kind of forced simplicity implied in the working. You don't want to fancify it or dress it up or make it something it's meant to be. So that it's a kind of a challenge to see how interesting you can uh, be as a composer within a comparatively small frame. I mean... <laughs> How about how about that for one pithy sentence of the essence of composing? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, here is this you know Jewish guy from Brooklyn who took a shaker song, "Simple Gifts," and and we actually played afterwards. Uh, uh, was it? Yeah, it was William Warfield. With interested this institute. Institute yeah. and, the and, and by the way, since you since you mentioned Britain, I, I'm sorry, I'm queuing this up the next cut. Since you mentioned Britain, it was actually Britain and Pear, Piers who inspired Copeland to to right. go after and and make the old American songs. He he had, uh, you know, he had heard the the, the British folk songs that in, in the folk song settings of various countries that Britain had done. And in fact, the premiere of the first book of the American songs of Copeland was at the Alderborough Festival in 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 England. So. You know, is a wonderful, wonderful community. I mean, are we, we should be grateful that Copeland and, and Britain admired one another so much. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it was quite wonderful. And they, they, all of these, you know, one of the things that I, I noticed, too, was that um, there was a lot of a lot of these American composers went directly to some of the greatest poets yeah. in, in America. I mean, if I could give you a nickel for every setting of Emily Dickinson that I listened to over the course of the two years that I worked on these various programs. Um, and it was wonderful. And there were so many different takes. Yeah. We, we used one of Copeland's takes on it. And then we, uh, we had Margaret, uh, oh gosh. Ruth um, um, Lang. Uh, I'm forgetting. Margaret, Margaret Lang. Uh, maybe, uh, but it, the composer, her, her, yeah, her, her playing the same, uh, yeah, yeah, Margaret, setting the same Ruth poem, yeah, Lang. yeah, Lang yeah, Lang. yeah, yeah. So this, um, we queued up a Ned Roram cut here as well. Oh yeah, so um, and, and Ned Roram, actually, I mean, we, Ned Roram is you know the 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 you know he's the godfather of if that's the right term <laughs> he's the He's the dean of American song composers, period. He's still with us. What is he, 97 or eight years old now? Yeah. It's, re yeah. it's remarkable. Uh, but his, 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 his oeuvre, his catalog is, is an astounding, eloquent testament of American culture from the 50s to the present day. It's, I'm, I'm yeah. boundless admiration. But he's also a great thinker and a great writer uh, and, and had some wonderful Diarist. things to say about, about, <laughs> about, about, about melody and tonal music. Should, yeah. we, have, should we have a listen to and, that? Well, well, let me give you just yeah. a tiny context because yeah. this will actually help propel us into the next uh, program. But, you know, we listened on this program to a little bit of Dalla Piccola and Milton Babbitt, uh, we heard some 12-tone yeah. stuff. Uh, and, you know, you've done some great 12-tone stuff on stage, you know? Wozzeck is beautiful 12-tone music. But uh, 
We chose a very early Ned Roram piece, and I found this clip again in NPR uh, clip of Roram talking about uh, serial music, uh, twelve tone music, and how he rejected it, but a lot of people went for it. Here's Ned Roram. He told NPR in 2003 that he was never interested in using serial techniques for his songs. When the serial killers came along, a lot of very tonal composers defected to the other camp, and they wrote what was being written in those days. A few still do, but some defected and came back. I felt like the prodigal son's older brother. I'd always been a good boy. <laughs> Roram became one of America's yeah. outstanding you know, composers. I love that serial yeah. killers. Yeah, yeah, it's very funny. But, you know, the next the next uh, show that we did was you know the return of melody, and you know it, it, hearing that piece actually reminded me of when I was at Oberlin. Um, I had a sabbatical. There was a sabbatical replacement who was uh, a composition professor. And he looked at a piece that I was working on and he just stopped in the middle and he said, you care what this sounds like, don't you? And I said, yeah, don't you? Doesn't everybody? He said, oh, you'd be surprised. Yeah. You know? And I was like, well, no, I can't, you know, so we, you know, and, and I was at Oberlin at the end of the seventies, beginning of the 1980s. And uh, you know, serial music or or even just sort of freeform atonal music was what was expected. Yeah, de, and so, de rigueur, as they say yeah. in the West. <laughs> and, and, you know, it was a good thing I was mostly writing musicals while I was there because I didn't care about it. But I, I, took, I took composition and I wanted to kind of steep myself at least a little bit into those techniques. And I, I think it certainly helped me as a composer to just be aware of what other people were writing. And, you know, if you went back to Oberlin 10, 15 years later, and minimalism had come and Adams had even gone beyond minimalism. But it's funny, we, we throw in, uh, in the return of melody uh, a letter that John Adams wrote to Leonard Bernstein, where he was like, hey, you know, why are you writing all this tonal stuff? And uh, we had Jamie Bernstein, who's uh, Lenny's daughter, oh, one of yeah. Lenny's daughters, right. say, you know, this is something my dad was like fighting all the time. Yeah. You know, should I be writing in this atonal style or yeah. should I be writing from my heart? And then, and then and, you turn uh, around and, and write something atonal or on the edge of it. Or, you know, if you listen to Chichester Psalms, you know, you need to have your head screwed on and, and kind of like, OK, you want to go there? I'll go with here for a minute, but I'm not going to stay over there. I'm going to, you know, or maybe just did both. I mean, what I always described it is, is you know, after the <laughs> I love the serial killers and, and I'm not being a <laughs> prat about, about modern music, avant-garde music. I think it's important to explore the soundscape and sound landscape of our minds. Uh, it's incredibly important. And, and I listen to a lot of avant-garde music and some I understand. Well, that's, that's, that's being generous. I don't understand a lot of it, but I'm fascinated by it. But that's not the point. But when it was again said, OK, at least parallel to that, you get to write polytonality and ergo melody again. The song world burst open. In the 80s, late 80s, 90s, the song world just, and in terms of classic song, burst wide open again. And I think that's, that's really important and, and, and beautiful. Let's listen to, um, to a couple of people talk about it. I, I love both the cuts you, you selected here from our show. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I am, I'm just going onto the website. You can see Song of America. I'm now back onto the Hamsong Foundation. So where, where, where this series lives, uh, uh, do you know explore. If you just go on and write WFMT, you'll see all the shows. Or if you go into resources or projects or plans, uh, the Hamsam Foundation is an enormous resource for song in all languages, but certainly the American song and German song have been the two biggest projects to date. But do have fun. We're going to go back into screen sharing and we're going to go yeah. into an already queued up 
Mr. Adamo. We're going we should, time a little bit, but here we are. What I, do think do? We should, I think we should play these two clips back to back. Good. Uh, first of all, I, you know, this was another one of those things where I was like, oh gosh, can I get some, uh, some clips from composers talking about melody, talking about what they're writing about. And Mark Adamo and John Carigliano, married couple, so it was a twofer. I got to go to their apartment on the Upper West Side. I talked to John, I talked to Mark, and we talked essentially about the same thing, which is what is melody and how does one approach a melody when there's so many great melodies in the world? How can you be original? So uh, I think back to back would be great to hear what these two guys had to say. Here, here's Mark Adamo, here's Mark Adamo, excuse me. Turn of melody. Let's start with a quick definition, supplied by composer Mark Adamo. Melody fills his songs and operas. Melody is music written horizontally. The logic of one pitch following another, the logic of one phrase answering another, that has much more to do with how we remember something melodically than whether there are chords of whatever shape under it. And then we play a musical context. Now I'm going to fast forward here to... And I can tell you that after that, uh, um, John was talking about the fact that, you know, it's the not musical, just... The musical omnivore. Go ahead. Okay. It's not just an, enough to write melodically. You have to kind of create punctuation. That's what helps to make the melody. But well, he I, kind of... Yeah. What I love is when composers talk about music and it becomes the obvious description of language. Because if there's anything I want to communicate to our, our non-performing or maybe even non-musician audience, but musical lovers, is that music is a language. It has grammar. It has syntax. It has all the subtleties of any language you might know. Uh, and, and when we hear major composers like Mark Adamo and John Coriano or certainly Aaron Copland talking about music, they're talking about a musical language to metaphorically stand for an emotional experience. And I, I find that really, really powerful. Here is John Corriano, one of America's most profoundly gifted composers. Capable of writing in a multitude of styles. He says one of his most difficult tasks as a composer is coming up with a genuinely original melody. It's hard because there have been so many great melodies. We have Schubert and Tchaikovsky and all of these masters of melody. And so it's hard to write a melody that has its own curve, that is your own, and at the same time, truly beautiful. It's very difficult. Well, it's I mean, interesting how they talk horizontal curve, exactly. you know. That, that's breakfast, breakfast table chit chat between two profoundly gifted uh, composers. I might add that, that uh, Mark is also a very, very gifted librettist. Yeah, And I might also just self-gratuitously add that he wrote a string quartet for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on Billy which Collins, is what we Billy am. Collins, we, and it has not been performed enough, and it's my, my fault, I suppose. And I just, and I just love these guys. Uh, John Corriano, I was going to do the revival of Ghosts of Versailles at the uh, Met, wow. but when the budget crisis hit them very much pre, pre-COVID, that was one of the first things on the chopping block, unfortunately, which was very, very, very sad. I would have loved to have done the the um, the Beaumarchais role for John. It's a it's a marvelous opera, The Ghost of Versailles, and the yeah. String Quartet, and and also Mark's operas. I mean, really a shout out for these guys. They're just just beautiful, beautiful music, and the concert pieces that constantly at least three hour, whatever it's called, the concert in the round and the circus. You know, these are incredibly inventive, in, inventive soundscapes that just kind of rattle who you are and, and invigorate who you are. And you come out having had an experience you can't even describe. That's for everybody, whether you're a musician or not. This is, this is, a, this is, the, this is the power of creative genius and why we should yeah. be addicted to it. Yeah. Return uh, of gravity. Wonderful. Yeah. And I should say, we, you know, we do end with that string quartet with the, uh, with the, the piece of ah the uh, Aristotle with the Billy Con yeah we end with ah. uh, Aristotle the end <laughs> I forgot that I forgot that it was with it. the with the uh, yeah 
and we talk about uh, poet Billy Collins and, uh, you know, I mean, and we had just talked with uh, Maria Schneider, the jazz composer who had set uh, Ted Kuzer, who was another poet laureate of the United States. Well, Stephen I mean, Paulus was... wrote me a cycle on his poetry, you know? Yeah. I need to do so, a recording of things that have been written for me, I must say. I'm, I'm a little guilty <laughs> on that. They're wonderful. I think films. you do. <laughs> you know, Michael I think you Thomas do. has written me three Whitman songs as well. And I was, I've had, I've had, it's been great fun to know these, to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to work with these wonderful people. Oh, my goodness. Jeff, did yeah. you enjoy doing the shows? Oh, my God. It was so much fun. It really, I felt like with every one of them, I learned so much. Yeah. I mean, I knew on some, far well, I knew nothing. On some level, I knew about the composers and the songs, but I really got to, to get into the bit stream and, and really discover what was going on with each of them. And, you know, we didn't always play uh, the song that I necessarily wanted to play that was representative of, of the composer, but we would play something that, would reflect the time. I mean, the Roram uh, piece that we played in, uh, in uh, The Return of Melody was actually written in 1969 during the Vietnam War and it was settings of Walt Whitman. All right, all right. Uh, and it was melodic. There's no question that it was melodic. It wouldn't necessarily have been my first choice if I was gonna play something, you know, from the late 60s to right. the 80s or 90s, but it represented what was going on. And I really enjoyed, you know, for instance, Ricky Ian Gordon, oh my. the AIDS, AIDS quilt oh, yeah. song book. Um, and we after, played some after Ricky came, came, came Jake Hagee, you know, yeah. Latham, you know, and, and Jennifer yeah. Higdon has written me a wonderful cycle. We celebrated yeah. the 150 year celebration of civil war of the, of the civil war with, a piece called Civil Words, and oh my goodness me, you know, it's uh, it's 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 so important. Now, okay, now that you surprised me, I did, I really honestly did not beat in I, either I forgot or didn't know that you were a composer. So, have you written songs? I mean, other than in your plays and your concerts, theatrical pieces, have you taken a poem and put it to music? Very rarely. I mean, in college, I set some E.E. E. Cummings poems. Oh, which I actually, you know, we, my mom moved out of her house a couple of years ago and I actually found it in a, in a box and I right. kind of pulled it out and I was like, eh, this isn't a bad song. But mostly I write songs within uh, the context of a theatrical production. And when, Although, you're, and, and when you're doing that, is your work with your librettist finding the syntax that matches the music that's coming to you because of the syntax? I mean, is it, do you guys work kind of like this, writing it? Um, well, these days we're working remotely, that's for sure. Um, but very often what he does is he will write kind of a first draft of a lyric or a libretto, and then I will kind of sit down and respond to it. And then once we get together we start kind of negotiating things and making making changes here and there uh working on structure i mean we hear so often about composers saying to a librettist or a, a, a or if they're working with a poet most composers don't really work with poets actually the, the the most successful adventure i know of and rather unique in american song history is tennessee williams and paul bowles yeah, uh, the Blue Mountain Ballads, and he, he played one poems of those poems. And Bowles, you know, wrote, and Bowles was an author as well as composer. And Tennessee Williams was just kind of an antenna to the American psyche, um, in in all of its glorious, horrifying, <laughs> horrifying manifestation. I mean, my God, oh my God. Uh, but um, where was it going? Oh, yeah. You hear about composers saying, you know, the wonderful stories of Verdi saying, oh, don't give me so many words. I don't need poetry. I need thoughts kind of thing. But in your working relationship, does your, do your librettist or your lyricist ever come back to you and say, oh, I don't get that at all. I don't think that's the right music for what I'm trying to say in the least. Oh, yeah. Look, the key to a good collaboration 
is to be honest with one another. And they're just tiny. And it's funny if he hands me a lyric and I have, I have a hard time setting it. Right. Uh, something's not percolating. Well, for I mean, me. It's not just a give and take that I'm after. It's actually that the librettist is saying, I don't think about music or maybe he does. Uh, I mean, if you're if it was Marco Adamo, you'd have a very complex conversation. But I mean, right. <laughs> literally, literally, as he hears his words, says this harmony doesn't resonate with me. I don't under, that doesn't sound like those words. Is that the kind of conversation you have? Oh yeah, I mean, there are times. There are times actually when he's surprised. It uh, when I said it in a way that it's nothing like he expected. I mean, he has a a sense in his head yeah. of, of how it might be. And I look at it and I'm kind of like, nah, this wants to be in five. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be like, what, you know, what? Oh, but that makes sense. You know, by have, by missing one beat here, it gives it a different set of propulsion. So it's, you know, it's always give or take, you know, and every once in a while I will just hand him, a musical idea, but usually because it's coming from a theatrical context, right. I need to have, if not a complete set of lyrics, then, you know, well, here's an idea. Here's a, a quatrain, you know, yeah. we used to have this, you know, if, if, if we got a verse or two finished, we'd go out and we'd have a breakfast or we'd have a celebratory lunch, yeah. you know. Oh, fantastic. And we've written very different kinds of things. Our, our biggest piece is a piece that was done at the Goodman Theater and at uh, the public theater called Wings, which was somewhere between an opera and a musical. It was about a woman who suffered a stroke and had aphasia. So language is pulled oh apart. Oh my. And as, as she gets better, those little musical motifs start to cohere and then they'll disappear and but we used to joke that you know the first half of the piece she was in an opera and the second half she was in a musical um but it was a very interesting very challenging piece to work on it was based on a play by arthur copet speaking oh of connecticut people yeah. um sounds like a show and, we need to do let's 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 unpack this american opera musical Thing. Oh yeah, and, I mean, that's I mean, actually a, a, a radio series under itself. I mean, I've always I've always said that you know the Gordon McCrae's of the '50s were trained very much like a young baritone like me would have been trained mm -hmm. you know, acoustically and as a classical singer. They sing completely different than what has gone on in in a, in a natural development. I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying that how we sing in musical comedy, as we call it, or musical theater today is different than, you know, 40 years ago. It's, you know, I've, I've always made in my heart and mind, a, there's a, to me, a specific type of, of musical theater that I'm comfortable with. It goes right up and, and splits in between Lenny and Sondheim. And mm -hmm. from, there, from there forward, that's a genre that's that's not my training. That's I don't know what to do. That this the things before that, you know that that sort of stand sing or walk and dance and sing or whatever all that might be, you know that 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 make makes sense. But I'm I'm fascinated by the American complex relationship to the idea of of opera versus musical theater. I think we should I think we should lay our swords down and just assume that it's like everything else in our country, a bit of a pluralistic conversation that is very yeah. valuable, that that we get to have both those elements. I just struck me yeah. the way you were talking about this piece. I, I think there's a lot of American musical theater that you can describe like yeah. that. Sondheim actually once was asked about the difference between uh opera and a musical and he said well look when Sweeney Todd is done in the theater it's a musical theater piece when it's done in an opera house it's an opera oh, amen and, and you know I'll tell you something it was fascinating there was a, a small um theater skylight opera I don't know if you've heard I've of heard them of, in yeah, Milwaukee them, yeah. they did a production of Wings and they double cast it it's a very uh it's a very difficult role for uh, a soprano and so they cast it with a musical theater singer and then and an opera singer. And they had two dress rehearsals 
and I watched both dress rehearsals back to back. Same production, but you know, different kind of vocal wow. impression. I, I thought they were both really valid and they both approached it yeah. uh, you know, from their disciplines. And the production was very solid. Did you get to hear way. Hamilton? Did you see Hamilton? Many, 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 many times. Seriously? I actually did it. Yeah, I did a documentary on <gasps> the Hamilton Education Program. I'll send you that. Oh, uh, right. On NPR.org. <laughs> But well, I'm, I one of the I'm one of the slugs in New York that, you know, queued up on, on the internet and finally got a, a ticket that I could pay for. And, you know, I mean, yeah. it was, you know, but I must say it was jaw dropping. But what I really want to say is that, you know, I mean, what the, I mean, it's a musical genre that is in and of itself. But those those folks have vocal chops. I mean, there's you know, this is this isn't, you know, this 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 what well, it's how I get aggravated when people say, Oh, Schubert and Leader, and, you know, it's all this fon, fon, fon stuff. And it's obviously you have never actually heard the Taucher or or any of the Greek antique leader, which are like small arias and so forth. But it's the same thing we do to musical theater. Oh, well, you know, opera and of course musical theater. Hey, you put your head and lips and throw it around Hamilton, then give me a call. <laughs> My mind I think there are more more words per square inch than so, I've ever somebody, heard in any I mean, show. I mean, I mean, so somebody's asked me, so are you going to go again? I said, no, I'm waiting for the sequel. <gasps> is there going to be a sequel? I said, <laughs> hope so. It should, and, kind of, and, it should, and what is it? I said, it's James Madison. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I'm a huge he, Madison I, fan. I think Madison yeah. is one of our great, great. Fascinating not, guy. Not, yeah, oh. he's an amazing influence and, and decency of democracy. Wonderful thinker. And we've really been thinking about him, uh, <laughs> consciously or not, lately. Yeah, yeah. In no, our democracy, that's for sure. Uh, Jeff, it's been a great visit, ladies and gentlemen. We've kind of splashed over, but you know, it's what we do. And and thank you, Adonjo.com, that we're allowed to splash at will and at need. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. Please, everything we've been talking about, I'm not trying to, to, I'm just telling you where to find it. If you're really interested in any of these things, please visit the hamsongfoundation.org uh, and we will send you to all the requisite places that tie up all these various uh, threads that we've been speaking about tonight. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. I will see you next week. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you who's coming, but it's quite exciting. Anyway, Jeff, I wish you well. Good for the holidays. Keep your keep your powder dry, as they say. Keep your door <laughs> shut and your mask on. Yeah, we shall see the other side of this shit. Yeah, Sorry for that. I look word. forward. <laughs> I look yeah. forward to seeing you in person and hearing you in person. I've missed. Will. I have missed live live performance so much. Um, uh, yeah, and, it's true. You know, it's true. We'll be well, back. We'll we'll I'll all be, be back. Exactly. On that positive note, we will be back. Thank you very much. Good night, Asian.